Hi everyone, it's great to be here in Madison and see all of your smiling faces. Uh, well, today I'm going to talk about what I call rationality in retrospect. And as usual, when I give a talk, I like to break into three pieces. Today would be no different. I'm going to, my main goal for the talk is I'm going to defend some orthodoxy about the relationship between rationality and correctness. And I'm going to do it by rejecting what I call a naive picture about what rationality and correctness are for. And the way I'm going to reject that picture is I'm going to try and share things exactly the opposite way around and try to defend the reverse of the picture. So without further ado, uh, the orthodox picture that I start with and want to defend starts with the idea that there are two important modes of evaluation that we use in order to assess actions or choices. We could be interested in both an objective mode of assessment or in a subjective mode of assessment. And the objective mode of assessment is naturally paired with words like correct or perhaps ought in the objective sense. Uh, and the subjective mode of assessment is naturally paired with talk about what's rational or what somebody uh, subjectively ought to do. We can make this distinction easily by considering the case of the poker player who is considering what they ought to do given their imperfect information about the world. And they know that the, what, which of two choices of calling or folding are the right choice uh, is going to be a matter of what cards their opponent has. And so, but they don't know what cards their opponent has, so weighing up their evidence and weighing up the, the benefits to be gained and their probabilities involved, they conclude that they should call. So they call, their opponent shows their cards, it turns out uh, the opponent had some pretty good cards. And so they lose the bet. And so afterwards, looking back, they think to themselves, you know, I should have folded. Given what I know now, that's the thing for me to have done. And yet they steal themselves to make the same situation, same choice again in similar situations in the future. So from this cool perspective, a backward looking perspective, it looks like the thing that makes sense for them to do is to fold. And yet they still want, when they're in the forward looking situation again, uh, and don't know more, they want themselves to do the thing that uh, uh, is the rational thing for them to do. Okay, now I want to step back. What's the orthodoxy that I want to defend about the relationship between rationality and correctness? Well, there's two pieces uh, uh, about, each, uh, about each of rationality and correctness. And without relying to, taking this analogy too seriously to natural deductive systems, we can think of them as a kind of in rules and a kind of out rules. The in rules are going to tell us uh, the conditions under which things are rational or correct, and the out rules are going to tell us the consequences for how we should treat somebody whose actions are rational or correct. So the in rules for correctness tell us that what correctness of action depends on are facts independently of what the agent making the choice uh, is aware of about those facts, their information about those facts. What the out rules tell us is that correctness matters for congratulating or commiserating with someone. If they have the correct choice, you congratulate them. If they have the incorrect choice, you commiserate with them, but it, does, it reflects on their luck and not on them. Whereas with rationality, what the orthodox view tells us is that the rationality of an act can depend on the agent's information independently of the facts. Indeed, even if their information is mistaken. And that's going to be important what follows. Uh, and the out rules for rationality tell us that rational actions merit praise. Irrational actions merit a kind of something like blame. So that's the orthodox picture. And if the orthodox picture is right, then rationality and correctness come apart because agent's information comes apart from the facts. And it's important that agents' information comes apart from the facts in two importantly different ways. The first is brought out uh, by what we might call the three envelope problem. In the three envelope problem, some agent, Amy, it has a choice between taking one of three envelopes, and she'll get to keep whatever money is in the envelope that she chooses. Uh, and the first envelope, Amy knows, contains $1,000. And she knows that the second envelopes contain 1500 and zero, but she doesn't know which one is which. So Amy's thinking about what to do, and she knows that the first envelope is not the best choice. She knows that anybody who knew all the facts would tell her something different about what to choose. Nevertheless, the, taking the first envelope is the thing that makes most sense for her to do. It would be um, irrational of her. It would seem like uh, something where, that would merit some kind of blame as a choice to take the risk of getting the $1,500 unless she needs $1,500 way more than she needs $1,000. So the other case, is Bernard Williams' famous gin tonic case. In Bernard Williams' gin tonic case, an agent, Bernie, has the information that comes apart from the facts because he's handed his uh, regular drink by his regular bartender who says, here's your gin tonic, Bernie, but it turns out that on this particular day, it contains gasoline. You know the story. 
So Bernie uh, takes a sip. Uh, we would think, yeah, he's doing pretty well. He's making a good choice. It's rational for him to take a sip. Nevertheless, we would commiserate with him for the consequences. Likewise, if Bernie didn't take a sip, we'd say, huh, what's going on with Bernie? Why isn't he like, he, why did he pay money for gin and tonic and then not take a sip? Uh, does he know what's in it? It seems like it's an irrational for him to sit down without taking a sip. And yet, uh, if we get the chance, we'd congratulate him. We'd be happy for him that he didn't manage to take the sip. And so congratulations and commiseration go with correctness and incorrectness, praise and blame go with rationality and irrationality. Now, these two ways that our information can come apart from the facts are very different. In the three envelopes case, our information comes apart from the fact because Amy's information is incomplete. In the gin and tonic case, Bernie's information comes apart from the facts because Bernie has got some wrong information. And it's going to be important for the orthodox view that I'm going to try and defend today that the agent's information in the sense that's relevant for rationality can include false stuff. That is part of what I take the orthodox conception of rationality to be. It's something that has been rejected by many people in the last 20 years. The people who reject it can still say that what's rational depends on the agent's information, but they might say that the information that matters is a matter of what they know, and hence it's factive, and so false beliefs can't make a difference for what's rational. So that, I would say, is a kind of retrenchment on the orthodox view about rationality and correctness, and it's a kind of retrenchment that, that sets us up for thinking that rationality and correctness don't come that far apart after all, because some other people tell us that correctness is actually partly a matter of pers the agent's perspective and depends on the agent's information as well. So once we start thinking that rationality is less subjective, uh, uh, we can be warmed up for thinking that correctness is less objective. And together, those are what warm people up for thinking that rationality and correctness go hand in hand. And I think they don't go hand in hand. They're quite independent modes of assessment. So I want to head that skepticism off at the source. I'm going to do so by thinking about more about this, how to defend orthodoxy, uh, full stop. So do that information come apart from the facts in each of these two ways. So that's orthodoxy. But I said that I'm going to defend orthodoxy by rejecting the naive picture. And the naive picture, besides being one of the first things that you might think about rationality and correctness, we should think of as a kind of overlay over orthodoxy. What the naive picture tells us is that rationality, which is, is the, what we should be using at the hot moment of choice, where we're trying to decide what to do. It is the right perspective, it's the right thing to think about when you're trying to decide what to do at the moment where you're looking prospectively at your choice. Whereas correctness is a kind of external perspective. Maybe we think about other agents' actions as correct, in our in the case of our own actions, we're primarily interested in correctness in a backward-looking way, looking back at which of our choices were the right ones for us to make. Now, the naive picture, I think, has several sources. One of the ways that we can motivate the naive picture is thinking very intuitively about the original case of the poker player. In the original case of the poker player, the poker player looks back from the cool perspective and concludes that uh, they ought to have folded. The judgment that they ought to have folded is the one that makes sense in light of all the facts. So it seems like that's a judgment of correctness, not of rationality. Whereas at time of choice, they, can, they concluded that they ought to uh, call. And that's the decision that makes sense as a true judgment about rationality. So if at the time of action they're thinking about rationality, and at the time of reflection they're thinking about correctness, that's going to make sense of what's going on in the poker player's case. That's a very intuitive way of describing it. That's the first motivation. Second motivation for the night picture comes from the three envelope case. In the three envelope case, it's not just the case that there are things that Amy, the chooser, doesn't know. It's actually the case that Amy, when she's choosing what to do, knows in advance that the first envelope is not the one that she should take. Amy can reason to herself as follows. Look, either the $1,500 is in the second envelope or it's in the third. If it's in the second envelope, I shouldn't take, uh, that's the one I should take. So I shouldn't take the first one. If it's the third one, that's the one I should take. So I shouldn't take the first one. So either way, I shouldn't take the first one. Therefore, I shouldn't take the first one. It's not the correct choice. It's not the thing that's the correct to do in light of all the facts. Because all the facts are this way or all the facts are this way. Either way, it's not the correct thing to do. Therefore, it's the incorrect thing to do. And not only is it the case that she can't be informed about all the things that are correct. In this case, she can be informed about one specific thing that's incorrect, yet it seems obviously not relevant for guiding her choice. 
Amy is going to be reasoning very poorly if she allows herself to be guided by this judgment about what choice is incorrect. So now it looks like correctness is a very bad guide for choice. There's a third motivation for the knife picture. The third motivation starts from the thought that what the three envelopes case and the poker player case really show us is that correctness is too hard to know about because of the way that it depends on things that are outside of agent's heads. And this gives you the idea. Well, if correctness is too hard to know about, maybe rationality is not so hard to know about. If rationality is not so hard to know about, then maybe rationality could be the appropriate perspective, the appropriate thing to think about in deliberation and think about what to do. But is, after all, it's the thing that you can rely on by relying on just what you're in a position to know. Now, this third motivation for the naive picture is very close in spirit to what we might naturally call the classical argument for internalism about rationality. The classical argument for internalism about rationality is the, very, the most traditional motivation for one of the ideas that it took to be central to the orthodox view about rationality and correctness. And that's the thought that the conditions under which something's rational or irrational are conditions that depend only on what's going on inside your head or inside your body. And they don't depend on things that are going on outside of you. So it's kind of internalism about rationality. And the classical argument is a powerful argument, especially from the perspective of the orthodox perspective, because it starts from the other part of the orthodox view about rationality, namely that you're always rightly blamed for your irrational choices. And the argument goes like this. Since you're always rightly blamed for making irrational choices, and blame is appropriate or right only if you could have known in advance that that was a choice that was irrational. But if what is rational depends on stuff outside your head, then you couldn't know that stuff in advance. Therefore, it can't depend on stuff that's outside of your head. The second premise of this argument is key. The second premise of the argument says that what's right to blame you for depends on what you could have known was true. That premise articulates the naive picture. According to the naive picture, rationality is that by which we are guided. So we could, how could it be that we can blame for you if that's not the position that you could tell whether this was the case, you were being rational and follow your goal of being rational and act by that? Otherwise, how could it be appropriate to blame you? So the classical argument not only resembles this third motivation for the naive picture, but in a way welds together the naive picture with the two core features of the orthodox view about rationality. Now importantly, the classical argument for uh, internals about rationality and internals about rationality as a whole have come under fire from a lot of theorists in recent years uh, due in part to Williamson's influential arguments against luminosity. The idea that mental conditions are things that uh, you're always in a position to know whether they obtain. And um, Williamson argues that that's not the case, that you can satisfy a mental condition without being in a position to know that you satisfy that mental condition. And so it's not in general true that you can tell whether you have certain mental, have mental properties. And so if rationality depends on any mental property, it won't always be true that you can tell whether or not you're being rational. The way that people have pushed back against this criticism, if they want to defend the orthodox view, has generally been to uh, attack anti-luminosity, which of course in turn is an attack on the classical argument for internal about rationality. But I'm going to take a very different course today. I'm not going to defend the anti-luminosity argument, but I am going to suggest that what we should really do is we should blow up the naive picture. So if we, once we grant with Williamson anti-luminosity that you're not always in a position to know about the stuff going on inside your head, we should accept that the difference between knowing what's going on inside your head and knowing stuff that's going on outside your head is at best a matter of degree and not in kind. And so neither of those two things is going to be intrinsically better suited or set by degree for being the prospective perspective on choice as opposed to the retrospective perspective on choice. Indeed, I think this should not be a surprise because when you look at agents like Amy and Bernie and our poker player, they're not spending their time thinking about their own mental states. Amy's not thinking about what she believes about what's in the envelopes. Amy's thinking what's in the envelopes. Bernie's not thinking about what he believes about whether it's a gin and tonic. Bernie's thinking about what's in his drink. And similarly, the poker player's not thinking about what they believe. The poker player's thinking about 
what, what's going to win them some money. Indeed, it would be weird if there were any other way. There'd be, kind of, there'd be kind of deliberative solipsism involved in having to make choices and spending your time thinking about those choices about what mental states we're in. And yet, to be well guided by judgments about rationality, to be trying to do the right thing, the rational thing, by following our, our best information about what's rational, that's the kind of thing we would have to be thinking about. So instead, I suggest we should think of rationality as the appropriate perspective for backward looking judgments. And indeed, this is exactly what we should expect. Because only in backward looking judgments are we in a position where it becomes salient to us and we need to step back from our own beliefs. Because after the fact, what we knew at the time, what our information was at the time, and what's true can obviously come apart. In all the cases that I described, the agents learned something more soon after acting. Bernie learns that it wasn't really gin and tonic. Uh, Amy learns which envelope had the $1,500. The poker player learns whether their opponent had good cards. When you learn those things, you can no longer look back at your earlier situation without reflecting on the fact that in your earlier situation, you didn't know all the facts. And so our information becomes very salient. Now, what do we do when we're looking backward at that information? I think we can see by thinking about the poker player. The poker player steals themselves in a similar situation to try to make the same choice. They resolve themselves to try to make a similar choice in a future situation. And what they're trying to do, I think, is they're trying to tune themselves in order to perform well in moments of choice as a poker player. So the performance argument for internalism about rationality starts with the idea that the rationality of your choice is a measure of the contribution to that choice that comes from your fine-tuned performance rather than from your circumstances. Rationality is a matter of what comes from you choosing well as opposed to from the luck of how things turn out. And performances can only be fine-tuned to factors that are not going to vary between circumstances of choice. Otherwise, you're not really fine-tuned for all possible circumstances. Good choosers are ones who could choose well in different kinds of circumstances. So features that are outside your head are going to vary between circumstances of choices, and consequently, what's rational for you can't depend on those features. This is a very different argument for internalism about rationality than the one that I considered before, the classical argument. It doesn't start from any considerations about blame or praise, and yet we can still draw consequences about blame or praise. Because after all, blame and praise are going to be appropriate for features of you, things that you contribute, whereas it's not going to be so appropriate to blame or praise you for features that are merely products of your environment or the circumstances that you happen to be lucky enough to be in. Um, uh, it might be appropriate to congratulate you or commiserate you for your luck, but to blame or praise you for things that do your circumstance would be very strange. In contrast, blame or praise for what is your contribution seems totally appropriate. So the moral here in a slogan is that on the uh, performance argument, being rational is something you do, not something that happens to you. And that's why blame and praise are appropriate. Kapoo! So much for the naive picture. So, so far what I've done is I've rejected the naive picture. I'd argue that thinking about what's rational to do is not a privileged way to decide what to do. And yet we had an earlier argument, the three envelopes argument, which seemed to show that thinking about what's correct is not a privileged way to decide what to do either. So maybe nothing is. And I think that's fine. That would be grist for the mill of those who think that what's important in deliberation is to think about doing the right thing, about which, which actions are right de re and not de dicto. If it turned out that there's no normative concept, that's the one that would be appropriate to be making all of our decisions by, then that's going to be grist for their mill. Nevertheless, I think this is not correct. And the reason it's not correct comes out when we take the original three envelope problem and we generalize it to include the case of a fourth envelope. In the four envelope problem, Xiao needs to make a choice. And like Amy, she gets to keep whatever is in the envelope that she chooses. She only gets to choose one envelope. The first envelope has $4,000, the second has $5,000, the third has $6,000, and the fourth one is empty. <coughs> and like Amy, she always incomplete information. She knows what's in the first envelope, and she knows the amounts in the other envelopes, but not their distribution. She doesn't know which envelope they're in. Okay. Now, the four envelope problem, in addition to having an extra envelope, is complicated by an extra layer. I have some other observers who are watching, they're friends of Xiao, they really want Xiao to get as much money as she can but they're not going to have a chance to communicate with her before she has to choose. And the first friend is Ying, and Ying knows everything that Xiao knows, but he also knows where the 5,000 is. And the second one is Zach, who knows everything that Ying knows, 
and also where the 6,000 is. So Xiao's thinking about what to do. And she's thinking, gosh, the expected value of the first envelope is 4,000. The expected value of the second envelope is 3,666 and change. So that's the same for the, the third and fourth. So I got, I, got, I got to take the first envelope. And Ying's thinking, OK, the first envelope has 4,000. Second envelope has 5,000. The third and fourth envelopes, their expected value is 3,000. So Ying's thinking, well, she got to take the second envelope. That's the one with the highest expected value. And Zach's thinking, the most envelopes in the money's in the third envelope. So Xiao ought to take the third envelope. So that's Xiao, that's Ying, that's Zach. I claim this is a totally reasonable, natural way for all three of them to be thinking. But now we've got a puzzle. So Xiao could be talking about what it's rational for her to do. Because what she judges that she ought to do is the thing that makes sense given her information. Zach, but on the other hand, Ying and Zach can't be talking about that. Because Ying and Zach make sense. But they both know that Xiao doesn't know which envelope has the 5,000 and the 6,000. So it wouldn't be reasonable for them to think that this is, that they're talking about what is rational for Xiao to do. Similarly, Zach could be talking about what Xiao ought to do given all the facts. But neither Xiao nor Ying could be talking about that. After all, they both know that Zach knows some stuff that they don't. And that whichever envelope has the 6,000 is the one that Zach thinks that they ought to take. And that Zach's the one who is in a position to know which one is the one that they ought to take in light of all the facts. So neither Xiao nor Ying could reasonably be understood as making confident claims about what they ought to do in what Parfait calls the fact relative sense in light of all the facts. So the question is, what is Ying talking about? What is he talking about if he can't be talking about rationality or about the fact relative sense of what? And my answer is that all three of them are talking about the same thing. They all reason in the same way. All of them compare the expected values. Um, all three of them uh, are interested in information uh, that isn't just information about what Xiao thinks. They're interested in where the, the money is in different envelopes. Um, they're all thinking, I claim, about which is the correct choice for Xiao to make. But, and the expected values that they're interested in are not the ones that come from Xiao's expectations. They're the ones that come from their own expectations. So it follows that the speaker's information is important in each of these cases. Now, from philosophy of language, we know that speaker's information can be important in different ways. It could be that the speaker's information shapes the context of utterance so speakers make different claims that can be compatible with each other um, or incompatible with each other in different contexts of utterance. And yet to believe the thing you say on this contextualist perspective, you need to believe that it is true relative to your current context of utterance. But to believe that requires knowing something about your own, the information of your context of utterance. And that's what we've concluded is challenged by differences between your information and your information about your information like that. that is brought out by the anti-luminosity argument. So what about, so I think that's not the way to go. What about relativism? Nico Collati and John McFarland argue about exactly this use of ought, that the information comes from the context of assessment. They're a relativist. But relativists think that believing a proposition, which after all could be true relative to some context of assessment and false relative to others, requires believing it to be true of your own context of assessment. But that again requires knowing something about what the information is at your context assessment. So again, the reasonability of belief in the ought claims on the relativist view requires reasonability of belief about your own mental states. In contrast, if the role of information is expressive, if we voice our information that they have, and that Xiao, Ying, and Zach all think different things because they have different information, not because they have different beliefs about their information, then we have an expressivist picture. The expressivist picture can make sense of why it is that Xiao, Ying, and Zach are all thinking in this way without thinking about their own information. All right. So what I've been saying is that odd and correct depend neither on the agent's information nor on all the facts, but on the information of the speaker. Um, and this, I claim, is exactly what makes them appropriate for deliberation. As a speaker, you're not thinking about your own information, nor are you thinking about anybody else's information, but you are thinking through your information. So if your ought judgments reflect that information in the same way as your decisions, if you're reasoning well, reflect that information, then your decisions will be rational just in case it will be rational for you to believe that those are decisions you ought to make. What about 
advice. Again, I claim this is what makes them appropriate for advice. When Zach and Ying are thinking about Xiao to do, if what they're thinking is about what is informed by their own information, that'll reflect the fact that when Ying gets the chance to tell Xiao, uh, uh, you know, give her advice, that Ying will advise Xiao to take the second envelope, even though, of course, he knows that's not the one that we best. And he also knows that's not the one that she already believes. Uh, so uh, it makes sense when he's giving her advice that it reflects his own information, because that's the best advice that he can give. And finally, it makes exactly uh, it makes sense of why it is that correctness and incorrectness are appropriate for congratulation and commiseration. After all, suppose that Xiao chooses the second envelope, and Ying sees Xiao choose the second envelope, and they don't yet, there's a long dramatic pause before they find out uh, what's in it, um, and find out where the $6,000 is. Uh, how's Ying going to feel about it? As long as what Ying cares about Xiao getting more money, Ying's going to be thrilled. If he had a chance, he'd go give her a high five. He'd run and tell her, you know, that's awesome, Ying. Uh, awesome, Xiao. You did um, better than I expected. Uh, of course, what were you thinking, he might say. You know, he might blame her for that choice, but still congratulate her on making a better choice than she would have if she was thinking well. Likewise, if what Xiao does is she chooses the third envelope. Um, and before they find out what's in the third envelope, how's Ying going to feel? Ying is going to be disappointed. He's going to feel like it's bad news that Xiao chose the third envelope. Not only was it irrational, but it was irrational and, uh, and worse than things could have been if she'd been irrational and chosen the second envelope. Now, it might turn out to be for the best. In the end, they will find out that it's for the best. But in the moment before Ying finds out that the third envelope has the 6,000, when he's thinking that the expected value of the third envelope is only 3,000, he'll be disappointed. And so it makes sense when he's disappointed for him to commiserate with her. Since congratulation is joy and commiseration is sadness, congratulation will go with correctness and commiseration will go with incorrectness, provided that both of those reflect the speaker's information. All right, so the performance argument explain why it is that rationality depends only on the agent's own information um, and that information can be false. It all depends on what's going on inside the agent and also why it is that rational actions merit praise and irrational actions merit blame. Um, and also just explain why it is that correct actions merit congratulation, incorrect actions merit commiseration on the picture they've been giving of correctness. Um, and you might think that I'll have trouble with this one, but depending on facts that are independent of what the agent believes, it doesn't require them to depend on all the facts. Both Ying and Zach think that the thing for Xiao to do is independent. It depends on stuff that Xiao doesn't know about. So both of them, as users of this concept of correctness, are happy with this. What they don't do is accept another thing that proponents of the orthodox picture almost always accept, which is that correctness is what Parfit calls uh, fact relative, in that it depends on all of the facts of the situation. So there's only one ultimate answer, and that's the answer that Zach has. That's not how Ying is thinking about things. And I think that's not correct. So you might think I've cheated by defining the first uh, con uh, condition, the in rule for correctness for the orthodox view uh, in a way in which I get to get it. But I think it's not cheating. This I think is the most contentious feature of the orthodox view. And it's most contentious uh, precisely because whenever we give examples as philosophers that motivate the difference between rationality and correctness, we as philosophers always get to stipulate what's going on in those cases. And since we stipulate what's going on in those cases, we're omniscient about those cases. So when we make judgments about those cases, those judgments look like they reflect all the facts, but they also at the same time reflect our information. So none of the cases that we give to motivate distinctions between rationality and correctness actually help us to distinguish between whether correctness varies according to our information as speakers or whether it varies according to the totality of the facts. Nothing that, no, none of those cases could do that. The only kinds of cases that could do that are cases like the one I gave in the four envelope case, where we're interested specifically in the verdicts of speakers who aren't us as describers of the case. So every case that pumps intuitions of listeners of the case about what's true, about what somebody ought to do or what's correct for them to do, is to have this fatal flaw. And since I think, since that's true, I think it's clear that this view is unable, nothing that we've done has been able to motivate this thing that's part of orthodoxy. And so we should be very suspicious of that part of orthodoxy. Final thought, uh, what I've done today is I've tried to flip our perspective on the difference between uh, rationality and correctness. Uh, and I look forward to hearing all your questions.
Thank you.